Brother Harold, here's a question. Tongues and prophets were used in biblical times so that all people could get the understanding from God's word. Also, not everyone had a copy. Now, with technology and advancement, is it not God who allows these advancements? This could help translate the Bible into other languages. So, uh, the understanding then is that there is some hesitancy to use technology, or that, there, that technology equals science, and science is then the antagonist to faith. Well, that's not completely true. I know a number of gentlemen who are translating the Bible. Uh, I have a good friend uh, down in Papua New Guinea who's translating the Bible for them, and he's using technology to do so. Uh, it, it is not something that we shy away from. It is not something that is um, at all against anything that we, that we are trying to accomplish. It, it, is, it becomes an issue when it begins to override what we know by faith to be true. In the, in the messages that we've heard, in the information that is given, if that begins to be overrode by the science or what they so call science, if that begins to be overrode by the technology, then that's when we need to take a step back and say, okay, this is, this is probably not the way we wanna go. But there isn't any hindrance to using technology into translating the scriptures. Again, we're using the proper scriptures to do so we're not going down the, the, the path that the scientists say of the critical text. We are using the proper text, but we can use technology to provide those translations into other languages, and I know many works that are doing so. Okay, uh, this is another question that's really directed to you. At least it's about what you said in your message Sunday night. He said, uh, why would God leave us to do the best we can with what we got? That was the question. We need a perfect word of God. And this was a question really that, that Dr. Gipp addressed just sure. a moment ago. But I figured because this was addressed to you, maybe you would want to add to it. The question is, what did people do before the King James Bible? I think Brother Gipp did a tremendous job in answering that from the very beginning of how we or the churches heard the word of God. Uh, so God used the men to speak. Holy men spoke the words of God. And we have that recorded as well. That continued on until uh, the scriptures were available. And once the scriptures were available in those ways, and then uh, what was the importance then? Well, the people had to come and meet to hear those scriptures and to hear those words and to get that encouragement. So, again, the very vital importance of the continuance of church attendance to hear the scriptures when after you know, the collapse of the Western Empire and the economy and everything, and when uh, materials to make the Word of God, such as parchments, uh, papyrus, all the other things, became extremely expensive, and then the copies were not as widely uh, put out there, of course, because of the antagonism of first the Roman Empire, then the Holy Roman Empire, and other things. So then it became very important and vital that they would come and meet and hear the word of God. So God had always had the availability of his people to hear his word so that they could have uh, his encouragement, his edification, his admonitions to continue on in their Christian life. All right, All right thank you, Brother Harold. Dr. Gipp, uh, a couple of questions here, sir. I didn't do it. <laughs> Please raise your right hand. And... <laughs> I, did. Hey, you, I can tell you this, when I first got saved, they asked me to give my testimony. So I just got up and preached. I thought, I ain't testify about Because that's all I thought. I thought, I ain't telling nobody nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that much time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. Uh, a couple questions about um, uh, the English language, per se. If the perfect word of God is our English translation, then what are, the one, uh, what, what are they supposed to use who do not speak English? Okay. Uh, that, that, that question is usually asked in this manner. If there's a perfect English Bible, there's got to be a perfect German Bible. Now, there was somebody that thought that. Um, perfect Italian Bible, perfect French Bible. We don't even want them to have one. Um, perfect Japanese Bible, perfect. You understand? And, uh, and here's, what I, uh, here's what I explain, if I can. Um, all right, God, God is, um, we are creatures of habit. <clears throat> uh, and, and God is consistent. 
Did we come from monkeys? No. No. But they have a similar framework. He used that framework many times. Uh, and then if you put, bend it over and put the front feet on the ground, you got horses, dogs, everything else. Okay? God, when he inspired the Old Testament, he inspired it in one language, Hebrew. Now, other than Daniel chapter 2, verse 24, to about uh, 7, verse 28, which is in Chaldee, but basically the Old Testament is in Hebrew. Then when somebody says... Well, if, if, if they don't speak English, where do they get a Bible? Where did everybody didn't speak Hebrew get a Bible? God didn't feel obligated to the whole world to give them the perfect word of God. Nobody told them, if you want access to the perfect Bible, learn Hebrew. But keep this in mind also. He, they are his chosen people, the Jews, are they not? But this wasn't like a plum, the Bible. It wasn't like a plum. It wasn't like a trophy. He also told them to go... Yeah, you know, if you thought about this, look at, look at Matthew chapter 23. The Jews were similar to this church in one respect. They had a mission program. The Jews believed in missions. He's abrading the Pharisees, and usually in verse 15, we only read part of this verse. Because we're always looking at the downside of the Pharisees. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for he can pass sea and land to make one proselyte. And then we continue on the second half of the verse and jump on them. But didn't he just, guys, guys, don't you, isn't that map? Don't you have uh, down your hall pictures of people who do what? Come past sea and land to make one convert. We even have evidence of the success of their mission program in Acts chapter 8, where a guy from Ethiopia, not exactly a Jewish country, was in Jerusalem worshiping because he'd been converted. So, he didn't just give them the Bible, but he said, go to the world, make them all Jews. When he came to the New Testament, <clears throat> he put it in Greek. All right, think about this. That's the dog's language. He didn't even put the New Testament in the language of his chosen people, the Jews. But were they not also given a mandate to take the gospel? So when he put them together... He put them together. <clears throat> now, I'm going to tell you what I think, which you can throw out. It doesn't bother me at all. I think the languages were going to be Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. <clears throat> Latin was, a, was a, the, the language of the Roman Empire. <clears throat> the, the three uh, uh, charges against the three descriptions uh, uh, on the cross were in what three languages? Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. You say, well, what happened to Latin? The Roman Catholic Church happened to Latin. And when they take a hold of something, that usually ruins it. Uh, and so God put the, the Bible in English. Now, it's, it's not a trophy. It's not, you know, you are these people, oh, you people that speak English, you think you're so special. No, along with it came a mandate to take the gospel around the world. And we have done it. The, uh, I'll bet you 95%, and that's maybe a lowball figure, 90%, 95% of world missionaries speak English. Or they're from English-speaking countries. I was in the Philippines. Yeah, I was in the Philippines uh, and I met a man from South Korea who was a missionary to the Philippines. Well, see right there. He didn't speak Tagalog and they didn't speak Hangul, Korean. The reason he could, the reason the guy from South Korea could minister to the, the Filipinos, they both spoke English. So, when he did it the first time, he didn't feel obligated to, any, to anybody else. He said, if you want access to my word, read Hebrew or learn Hebrew. I imagine the Arabs like that. When he put the New Testament down, he didn't even put it in Hebrew. He told his own chosen people, you want access to my perfect book? Learn Greek. So the first two times he did it, he did it in one language and did not feel... I always say this, don't obligate God to something he didn't say. And he never said, I'm giving it to you in every word, every language. So it's not inconsistent since he did it twice already that when he put it in one language, he told the whole world, get that language. So, help you? Yes, uh, follow up to that. Are there people who do not use English as their primary language, as their first oh, language? Oh, tons of them. That believe, yes. <laughs> amen. In this country. <laughs> that, yes, amen. Who believe that the King James Bible is God's perfect word? Um, you know, I can't speak for people. But yes, in fact, um, in 1999, I was in, it was in Seoul, South Korea, 
They had just translated not the TR, but the King James into Hangul. And, and you know, in, in many of those Asian countries, they're very intellectual. This, these, these guys were very sharp, very intellectual. And here is this. Now, now, you know, if you worked at translating something like that into your language, I mean, you would have some kind of like pride in it, wouldn't you? And here's what he said. He took my King James Bible out of my hand and he held his fresh off the press hand ghoul copy of the King James and he said, this, what he just got done working on is not the perfect word of God. This is. And believe it or not, I get requests all the time to translate my understandable history into, into Spanish, which really makes me scratch my head. I mean, you know. In fact, can I give you a sidebar? Have you ever heard anybody people, people say, well, what about the Spanish? Uh, I was at a church some time ago, and, uh, and I, taught, uh, I taught the agape phileo. And the pastor's a King James guy, and he came to the pulpit and went, uh, I never heard anything like that in my life. So every morning I met him in his office. The next morning when I met in his office, he had his desk, he had a chair backed up to it, nine chairs for his staff. They were all there in a semicircle. He sat me down, introduced me to his staff, and walked out. And for two and a half hours, I fielded questions because none of them believed the book. And my wife said, well, how was that? I said, I don't mean this wrong, guys, no pride, batting practice. Uh, but, the, but on the far right was the guy with his Spanish ministry, and I knew what was coming. Because they, they, they like go, you gringos, you're racist. So I wait, he says, what about the Spanish? I said, uh, you ever read uh, Romans chapter uh, 15, verse 24 and 15, 28? Oh, yeah, I said that's where Paul says I'm going to come by you into, I'm going to come by you into Spain. Spain existed in in Paul's time, correct? What language do you figure they spoke? Probably Spanish. I said, buddy, if God wanted to put the Bible in Spanish, he had a chance. He rejected it two thousand years ago. And, and and think about this. And I I do I just you know. I get tired of their ego. So I said, uh, and think about this. When he refused Spanish, when he rejected Spanish, English doesn't even exist. He didn't say, I chose this instead of yours. He says, I just don't want yours. <laughs> but here's the reason. Here's the reason. These countries here are the ones that are premier of taking the gospel around the world. Somebody write this down or remember it. There's a book out there about that big called, it was written in 1945, called They found the church there. And it was, it was a testimony of naval uh, aviators and sailors during World War II had washed up on a beach somewhere in some South Seas Island, woke up with a black guy with an afro and a bone in his nose, a machete in his hand. And when they woke up, they thought, uh-oh. And he said, come on, I'll take you to the missionary. He said, one, one guy said they had seven of us and these two guys, they were taking us in a swamp and we knew we were in trouble. We knew they were, we were at their mercy. And he said, and then they started whistling onward Christian soldiers because English speaking people. So this is not a badge, people. This is, not, this is not a plum. This is not a reward for us. This doesn't make you better than anybody else. With this comes the mandate to take the gospel. And, and it's always been that way. Can I ask a follow-up question? I know some folks have asked this of me. So in a practical sense, I believe I know what your answer is, but I'm going to ask it from that vantage point. Are you saying then that when we go to Cambodia, when we go to Spain uh, or Mexico, or we go to any other country that does not speak English as its primary language, we need to teach them English so they can have a Bible? Um, the gospel, it, it depends. The gospel can be understood in just about any language. And that is the first thing you want to do, correct? Get them saved. Um, you know, people say, well, then you got to learn English. Well, if they want access to the perfect Bible, they need to learn English. Just like if they wanted access to the perfect Bible, they needed to learn Greek. Just like if they wanted access to the perfect Bible, they needed to learn Hebrew. This is not a Ruckmanite being exclusive. This is what God did three times. Um, but I have no problem. I mean, you know, I wouldn't go in there and, uh, and, and rip on them about, uh, you know, in, in many of those countries, they have an NIV in their language. And if it's the only Bible, I just would stay away from the passages. Uh, I, knew a, I knew a missionary to, the, uh, to, to Mexico, and he said there were about 35 places where the Spanish Bible that I used had mistakes, and he said, I'd correct it with the King James. 
But he, but he preached out of that Bible. So, you know, I'm not a snob about that or, or uh, exclusive, you know. I'm not going to go, well, we have a perfect Bible and you don't. It, but that's what God did three times. Another follow-up? Uh, yes. Well, I was thinking about what you said, and it is interesting, just as a personal thought, that the people who would accuse uh, a King James Bible believer of being ex- exclusive uh, many of them tell us we don't have the perfect Bible in English. We have to go back and try to find it in the Greek. So it's mm-hmm. a similar argument anyhow. Yeah. Uh, but I do have a, a question here, and if you can help me figure it out, that would be very helpful. Um, <laughs> I have the gift of interpretation. <laughs> how the question is even worded, I'm not sure. But not to uh, denigrate who asked it, but I don't quite understand it. Does it not seem that most KJB advocates tend to fall in one people group and generally be one primary language speakers? Let me ask you a question. Does that guy know all King James Bible believers to make that statement authoritatively? See, that's the thing, guys. If you let them be the cop and, and you accept something, how does that guy know? He doesn't know. But I'll give you this. I'll tell you what, have you ever heard, have you ever heard, well, you know, the King James issue wasn't even around in, in, before 1950. And... Um, I thought about that, and personally, I figured this. I figured it probably started around 19, uh, 1881, right after the RV. That's what I thought. I told you, I, I read all the time, guys. I'm always in stuff, and it's ancient stuff, and it's old British writers who I am so glad they're dead. <laughs> so I'd hunt them down. And I was reading a book in 1824, and the guys, believe it or not, he's an independent Baptist preacher writing a book against a coming Baptist translation that was going to put the word immerse instead of baptize. And he said, then we're going to be like Jehovah's Witnesses. We have to have a Bible of our own. And he made this statement in 1824. He said, now, I don't believe our English Bible is absolutely perfect like some of my friends do. So there were Ruckmanites in 1824. I don't know. So I don't know where some of that stuff got started, but that's documentation for that statement. But you know, that's it. You know, see, that's that, that's that guilt trip. Well, you English speakers, you think because you got the Bible. Whoa, whoa, those are the guys that took the gospel. God could have gone three directions from Jerusalem. And he didn't go Africa and he didn't go Asia. He went to Europe. And those guys got that book and took it around the world. So, you know, that, that he once put us on the, on the defensive like, ooh, you know, what he ought to do is say, God, who do you think you are gone to Europe? That's what he ought to say. And, and I don't answer for God, but I hope that guy's saved because I want to be there when God answers that question for him. Anything else? No, nope. go back to Brother okay. Harold. You, in regards, uh, this is a different type of question. This is from someone who reads their Bible on a regular basis and uh, apparently believes it. Uh, they ask this question, uh, what, <clears throat> if any, difference is there between the words... Lord, all caps, Lord, only the L in caps, and then, um, I don't know what the difference is, capital L and O-R-D in small, oh yes, capital L and then O-R-D in small caps. Um, well, my basic understanding, and if Brother Gip would like to follow up with that as well, is uh, in the translation of the nomnia sancta, or the, the holy names, you have there in translation uh, an emphasis and so an emphasis of the Lord thy God, when they wanted it really with that deep, booming voice, it was all caps, like we would in a text. Uh, you think that, well, they wouldn't know that back then. Well, why not? Uh, and then the continuing on of that as translations and going forward is just the Lord. It's still a holy name, and we still want it capitalized. But it, it, it isn't that emphasis that is given to the all caps when you see that, when you see the Lord processing and you hear it all in all caps of the Lord thy God. I mean, they wanted to make sure that it was imprinted on your mind that this was very, very big that was happening at that time. So that's my understanding of how that translation comes in the holy names in translation. Right. Uh, One more question for you while you're up there, and that is from a teenager perspective. Sure. Um, how can I understand reading the King James Bible? It, it, it is uh, 
the words are so big and it makes it difficult sometime for me to understand and I fall asleep. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I fall asleep reading a lot of things. Uh, so one, it, it is true what Solomon said is that uh, as much study is a weariness to the flesh. That's not an untrue statement. You can read almost anything and fall asleep. They could probably read, um, go through mathematics and fall asleep and things of that sort. There are things there that are difficult to understand, but it isn't written in a way that was at all difficult for us to gain that understanding. That's part of growing. That's part of studying. We are to study to show ourselves approved. Imagine that the King James Bible was written to the common man. It was written to the common man. It was written in the common tongue. It was not written to the intelligentsia or to the nobility of the time. It was written to those who were just out working on the streets of England. And so it was not written for us to have this high sense of it. It was written for our understanding. And as far as I know, the last uh, study of what level of reading is necessary for the King James Bible, it's still the sixth grade. So if you have a basic understanding of English up to the sixth grade, you should be able to understand the King James Bible. Of course, we have many tools that help us out with that. It's, there is no shame in reading it with a dictionary or a concordance and helping your understanding of that and getting that. And there's no shame in that. In fact, I believe God designed in a way for you to come and ask, hey, I'm, I don't quite understand this. Can you help me with it? So I understand that, of course, reading through it, as in reading anything, you can fall asleep. But uh, as we continue to grow and mature and God puts us in, it, in our hearts to understand and study more, because that's how we show ourselves approved to him, that it will become more and more illuminated to us. And also with the helps of all the tools that have been given throughout all the ages. All right? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gipp, question for you. And this kind of ties along with, uh, ties into what you preached on Sunday morning. <clears throat> How do we know what the definition of a book is in the Bible? The book of the law was written on scrolls, but yet it was referred to as the book of the law. Yeah. If scrolls can be referred to as books, why can't other things such as tablets, whether stone, clay, or electronic, be referred to as books? Do, do we think somebody's picking a semantical definition? Remember what I told you about, about debate points? That's a debate point question. And um, I don't know. So he can disqualify everything I said if you'd like. Okay, next question. <laughs> uh, the, please explain the origin of the Apocrypha. Oh, the Apocrypha were uh, books that were, that were never inspired. Uh, wait a second, wait a second. I got him here. Hang just one second. Um, the Apocrypha were never, uh, never accepted. Oh, here it is. Here it is. All right. Seven reasons why the King James translators <clears throat> did not believe the Apocrypha were inspired. Number one, not one was written in Hebrew. They're, they're supposed to be Old Testament books. None of them were written in Hebrew. Number two, none of, them, none of the writers claimed to be inspired. How many times you read in your Bible, Isaiah says what? The Lord said unto me, or thus saith the Lord. Jeremiah, thus saith the Lord. None of them claim to be inspired. Three, they never acknowledge, they're never acknowledged by the Jewish church nor sanctioned by the Lord. The Lord never used any of them. I think, if I'm not mistaken, every book of the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament except maybe Esther, which documents 65, uh, or, or I'm sorry, 38 of the 39 books of the Old Testament, but nobody quoted uh, in the New Testament from the Apocrypha. Four, uh, they were not allowed amongst the sacred book during the first four centuries of the Christian church. Some years ago, I did the King James Conf uh, Conference here, the 24-hour, and we did on the, 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 the canon. And by the end of the third century, maybe early, maybe early um, the canon of the New Testament was confirmed. It was settled as 27 books that you have in your New Testament today. And when they did that, they never inserted any of the apocryphal books and they didn't put them in any of the Old Testament books. Um, they contain fabulous statements, statements which contradict canonical scriptures and themselves, uh, such as Antioch's Epiphanes dies three different deaths. 
in as many places. Let me see if I got. Uh, I had something for my. Uh, anyway, Antioch's Epiphanes, uh, in one time, in, in 1 Maccabees, he is marrying some woman, and these priests of, uh, I think, Nania, kind of like, uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis wrote it. They don't like him, so they're up in the, they're above the ceiling, and they cast stones down on him and kill him. So that's one time he dies. Uh, and then there's another time, I'm trying to think, he's uh, on a, on a, uh, in 2 Maccabees, he's in a chariot on his way to conquer Israel, and worms eat his stomach, and they fall out alongside the road, and he dies. And I can't remember the third time he dies. It might be COVID. But, um, <laughs> but literally, there are three distinct deaths of Antioch's Epiphanes in the apocryphal books. And, and so that is kind of a contradiction. Uh, they teach anti-biblical doctrines, prayers for the dead, sinless perfection. Uh, seven, they teach immoral practices like lying, suicide, assassination, and man manic uh, magical incantations. Um, Apocrypha, they, are, they, are, they were never ever accepted by, some of this guys, I'm sorry. I know we say we never accept tradition, right? But at some point we have to go back there and trust those guys that said these 27 books belong in the New Testament. They were right. These 39 belong in the Old Testament. They were right. I'm sorry, you're going to have to trust what somebody else did. And those same people never accepted the Apocrypha. Now, along the argument that, well, it was in the King James Bible in 1611, it was put between the Testaments because there is a certain amount of history. The Maccabees. Uh, the Maccabees were uh, in a revolution against Rome, uh, and so there is some viable history, but, but they never counted them, they never put them, uh, dispersed them in the Old Testament like they do in a Roman, uh, in a Roman Catholic Bible. Does that help you? Yes. Uh, how would you respond to someone, and I'd like to hear the answer from you and from uh, Brother Harold as well. How would you respond to someone who, who says, uh, the Bible's been written, rewritten so many times, how can we trust it? Well, that, you know, that is one of the Muslim claims. The Muslims say, you know, our book's only been, you know, there's only one Koran, uh, and you guys got all this. Uh, let me tell you, I, it was in a church in Ohio about, 30 years ago, uh, I think we have them. Uh, Gipper, do we have the uh, Valiant for the Truth series on the table? We did a, we, we did a uh, it's similar to ACE 12 uh, lessons for grades 11, grade 12. And there was a young man that literally, I was there when he was born, when he turned a teenager, his parents took him through those. Uh, he got an appointment to the Air Force Academy. And, um, uh, he wrote his mom about two weeks after he's in the Air Force Academy. He said, Mom, we just spent 14 days out bivouacked. And he said, I'm in a 14-man tent. And he said, we got talking about the Bible. So he's in, he's in a tent with 13 other guys, lost. And you know what they all said? You know what lost man's logic is? They said, if God really wrote the Bible, there wouldn't be so many of them. That's lost man's logic. You've got to be saved to believe you can have four Bibles. You've got to be saved to be stupid. Not stupid to be saved, but saved to be stupid. So that question is really not faulted on me. That's faulted on all those people that have absolutely watered it down, changed it every time. Um, and so what I do, you know, like uh, I think somebody asked the other day, you know, why the King James and not something else? Uh, if I had one reason... It would be this. I don't know if you, guys, all right, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus Christ die on a cross? Okay. You believe that? All right. Don't we say we believe that because it's in the Bible? Then couldn't we safely take our belief in the crucifixion, set it aside like it didn't happen, and, and then read our Bible? Would it not bring us back to the cross? Some years ago, I think it was John MacArthur, uh, said it was not the death, of, uh, not the blood of Jesus Christ, it was his death. So rather than just rail on him, and he did say that. Uh, and, I, and, and look, the guy, you know, I'm not, I'm not calling him a heretic. Uh, he's allowed to be wrong someplace. But um, so what I did is I just, now look, if it's the blood and not just the death, can't I safely take the blood and set it aside and read my Bible 
And here's what happens. You guys that learned it was the blood and got three verses from your Sunday school class. Okay, what I did every time it said blood, I put death. And there's places where it says blood and it can be just death. But there's places where it says blood. I mean, come on, without the shedding of death, that it can only be blood. And then by setting it aside and letting the Bible reteach you, you don't have three verses, you got a dozen. So I went, I was led to Christ by a guy that believed the King James Bible, went to Doc Ruckman's, who they, they say he believed the King James Bible. And my first year, and I was only saved a few weeks, and I said, you know something, those two guys believe the book. The guy that led me to Christ and the guy that uh, is teaching me, that's the two worst reasons in the world for believing the King James Bible. So I said, I didn't say I didn't believe it, I set it aside. And I just looked. And it's kind of like the UFC. You put them all in the ring, and before long, the King James Bible has thrown them all out of the ring. Like I said at the end of the one lesson, if the new Bibles are so easy for God to use, where's the revival? I mean, and there, there ought to be a national, with all the Bibles that are now easy to understand, there ought to be a revival in this country that would make the Great Awakening look like a cold spot in our spiritual temperature. And they're nowhere. That is the book that God has used around the world. That's his testimony. And that is objective. That's not a Ruckmanite or a Bible believer trying to find some evidence or trying to convince somebody. If you don't want to accept that, doesn't bother me. But you can't find God using those other versions. Not, you're not finding revival. And like I said, if you're going to call a revival 10,000 people in a black room with, with laser lights and drums, if you call that a revival, we, we are not going to be on the same page. Does that help you? Yes, sir. Thank okay. you. Uh, I'll go to Brother Harold and then come back to you. But I want to stand here for a while. <laughs> uh, Brother Harold, ask you the same question. How would you respond to somebody that says the Bible's been rewritten so many times? How can we trust it? Okay, so uh, we've received a lot of that information from Brother Giff as far as uh, it really isn't a rewritten Bible all the time. We've got two. Uh, and then many from after that. So then again, you start thinking of, okay, well, if one is trustworthy, why doesn't everyone trust it? Okay, so in all of this room, I, I will tell you my personal belief in a cell phone. I am a Californian, therefore I like Apple products, period. There is no phone outside of that. I don't care about Google. I don't care about anything of that sort. I trust Apple that when I pull it out of the box, it will work exactly like I want it to. And that's why I like them. Now, okay, aside from all the politics and everything else that comes with Tim Cook, I understand all that stuff, but when it comes to the essential of its design, its usage, its function, there is no other one. Now, how many of you in here disagree with me? Oh, that's a great bunch that disagree with me on that. Okay, so with that disagreement, even though I can tell you that it is, it works, I can show you that it works. It does exactly that at what I want it to do, but because there's disagreement, you will go to another thing uh, or another product. Why is there a distrust in the King James Bible? Because there is active spiritual intervention in this world. There is. But we'll talk about it more tomorrow about the idea of spiritual agency and, and human agency. And what that means is that, okay, who, what's going on behind the scenes? Is it man-made? Is it spiritual-made? Well, there's definitely spiritual agency going on. There is something spiritual going on to say, I don't want to trust that book. And because we don't want to trust that book, we must go another way. And that's why there are so many other revisions. And there's even more to it. I mean, we could even boil it down to the very simplicity of greed that they copyright those books and that you cannot, that literally some of those, you can't even put up on the screen if that you were so inclined because it's copywritten. And you need to get their permission and you need to pay for their license and you need to pay for all of those things. And of course, so we'll leave it to a man who, hey, if I can make a buck out of this, am I going to? Of course they are. So if that means, okay, we're going to write this and that's why we probably have 560 English Bibles, because there is something to be made out of it, as he said. And of course, there is spiritual agency. There is something going on in the spiritual realm, in the heart of men, and even the heart of Christians who, who get bitter or hurt at something to say, okay, I don't want to trust you. 
So therefore, I need to go to somewhere else. And if that's somewhere else, and they come back with the King James, and he keeps convicting me about what you are saying, then I need to have it rewritten. And I need to have a, a version that does not convict me of the problem I had with you. Such as, you may not like Apple because of the convictions of Tim Cook. Understandable. But because of that, you are not going to go back to that product no matter how much I try and advocate it to you. Same thing with, with, those, with those books and all of those things there. Amen? Good, good. Uh, one more question for you, and yes. I'd like to Brother Gibb to answer this one as well. Uh, it really is, it's, it's an opinion about the future. Um, you're in your 40s, I believe. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> yes, I'm in my 40s. So. Can, can I have some of your hair? That's the... <laughs> Can I have the color of your hair? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question is for, and uh, you and I have talked, I know that uh, you desire to be a pastor. Um, I have heard there are a lot of pastors, young pastors in their 30s and 40s that have been asking the question, uh, when do we get to update the Bible? When can we have a Bible in, quote unquote, our uh, language, the language of today? And I, obviously, this is not a uh, fact-based question. This is a philosophy question in so many ways. Uh, but it's about the future, and it's about what's coming uh, down the, the road in the next generation. How would you answer that? My answer, first of all, to him is, why is there a need? What is, what is the purpose of that translation? What is the heart? What is the intent behind it? And usually it is because we're losing people. We're losing people. Well, then I have to start thinking back to, okay, if, if that is the whole drive to change what we believe is the perfect word of God, if that's the whole drive, then where in scriptures do we have that as a precedent to make changes is if we're losing people. And then you have to start looking back, okay, they always go to Jesus. Jesus would not have done this. Well, I always think of, John chapter 6, where he had a, a huge following. Jesus had a huge following. And at that time, he had to begin to teach them some doctrine. And he started talking about the bread of life and eating the bread of life. And they start saying, this is a hard saying, uh, because they could not understand or comprehend that he was not talking physically, that they're like, okay, we have to become cannibals? Is that, is that real? And they weren't trying to to work through it. They weren't trying to say, okay, master, can you explain this more to us? It is after he made that statement, they just automatically in their mind made a decision, uh, we are leaving. We're leaving. Not coming back to him saying, please explain what you, what you said. We don't get it like the apostles did. They, they didn't do any of that. They already made this made it up in their minds that we're done. We cannot accept this. We're leaving. So did Jesus say, wait, 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 before you go, let me change my doctrine, change what I said, change my statements. And he did not do that. He didn't do it. They left. As heartbreaking as it may have been to him, they left. But that didn't mean he was going to change the truth or change what was already there for their comfort. And that is the question that I ask back to him. Is this where we have come to? Is this a change for comfort? Or is this truly a change because we truly believe that God has spoken to us to say to do this? And generally, it always goes back to we are losing people. And I say, well, that, that is not a precedent to, to initiate a change of this magnitude. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kipp, would you mind answering the same question? Uh, yeah, repeat it, if you would. Yeah, the question is, uh, for instance, the MEV is being pushed heavily by young fundamentalists, yep. and though we would not be in uh, mainstream fundamentalism mm -hmm. here at Hope, but I know some people, acquaintances, um, and I have had a pastor call me and say, I know a bunch of young guys that are running after this. I want to help stop the flow. Uh, and the big question they have is, why can't we have a version? Why can't we update the words yeah. for today? If man is God, we should. 
if man is God, then we should have a plan of salvation that doesn't require us to trust Christ. I'm just going to be good to keep to the commandments. God does not bow to man. Man bows to God. And if they're really interested, they would take, you know, I, I told you guys, um, I read the New King James four times cover to cover. I'm hoping there's a special reward. <laughs> but um, the New King James, which is not good, is better than the MEV. The MEV is more like the ESV than the, than the New King James. So if this guy has any allegiance to clarity, accuracy, authenticity, purity, why wouldn't he take the MEV and see where it's got mistakes in it and go, I don't want to use this. When, when somebody says, my, the first thing on my, my list to examine a Bible is, it's got appeal to me, the guy needs to get humble. He thinks he's a god. And, yeah, that's it. He just needs to, guys, I'm going to tell you, I am convinced that the sin of all sins, and you can probably think of some horrible sins, but the sin of all sins is pride. It keeps a lost man from humbling himself and getting saved. It keeps a saved man from, from humbling himself and getting right or accepting a Bible that is just not written to me. Uh, my son John, the oldest boy, oldest son, I remember when he was in, uh, Kathy was, uh, she was the homeschool teacher. I was the principal. I was the motivational therapist. <laughs> she taught him. I made him want to learn. And um, I can still remember him saying, why do I have to learn math? I'm never going to use it. And they joined the Marines where you're supposed to kill people. Okay. <laughs> Two minus one. Anyway, um, <laughs> and you know what he does today? He has a construction company. He figures out, he figures out, he, he um, figures out all of his equations, all of his subs. He, he uses all that math that at that young age he thought he never had a use for. And you got somebody going, well, I want one. Well, why don't you grow up? Are you not the center of the universe? God is the center. And we change for him. Um, Anybody that has any kind of a discipline, I don't care if it's golf, I don't care what it is, you tried and tried and tried and tried. You learned the piano, you tried, and it sounded awful, did it not? Until you got it down. We come against the Bible and go, I don't understand that word, I'm going to quit reading it. Wow, you, you're so dedicated to golf or playing an instrument, but the most important thing on this planet physically, the only thing, think about this, is the only book on the planet that does not come from the planet. Every book on my table, every book on that other table, they come from the planet. And, and you, will, you will do all these things. Oh, yeah, I, I knew a guy read a karate book four different times. Okay, that's all right, that's all right. But you better read your Bible more. But that karate book isn't that important. And so I really think the problem is somebody's just really, you know, you know, we, uh, you know I come from the generation that if you took our shirt off, we had a blue T-shirt said, Blue T-shirt with a big red S on it for Sam. And um, most 30 and 40-year-olds, excuse me, guys, but, but most of them, if you take their shirt off, they get a T-shirt on that says, what about me? It's all about me. It's not all about you. We have to, guys, I rejected what I was taught for 20 years about salvation the day I got saved. I did not say, why didn't God give me a plan? You know, I, I get this a lot. Somebody will say, well, I, asked, I had somebody challenge the Bible about Easter. I said, well, give them these verses. I give you. And he goes, well, I gave that to them. And I said, what'd they do? Well, they didn't accept it. So what else do I give them? I said, did you ever give the gospel? Yeah. What if somebody doesn't accept it? Do you give them another gospel? We're only bound to tell the truth. We can't make them accept it. And if some guy's pride doesn't like, he makes him not like the King James Bible because he thinks he has to have one addressed to him, I'm sorry, brother, that scares me to death. So, I, I probably doesn't sound nice, but he's probably, this guy's probably, you know, his, his latte is foaming right now, you know. He, he just texted me and said, I'm offended. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you something, guys, let me tell you something. As a Roman Catholic, I'm riding with a Christian. Did you ever read, just, just riding along, and you just read something out loud? You know, you just see something and read it like a billboard. And for some reason, I can still remember, 
Holy Rosary Monastery. We just went by that sign. I read out loud. This Christian went, oh, the rosary. Now, I've been going to this Baptist church, and they ripped on everything in my Catholic religion. I, and I, at that moment, I thought, well, the rosary is the only thing they hadn't ripped on yet. I said, what's wrong with the rosary? I said, just a bunch of beads. Oh, man, was I mad. And at that very moment in my heart, I went, there goes my rosary. Because I knew it was just a bunch of beads. I'll bet you at least a third of the people in this room before you got saved, something about the gospel made you mad. And we were, well, we don't want to offend anybody. Getting offended, told you're wrong, is one of the best things ever happened to you. How many people went to hell because somebody didn't tell them they were wrong about what they thought about salvation? How many people died because somebody said, you know, if you just eat uh, grape nuts or whatever, you'll, you'll get over your cancer, and they died. At some point, you've got to be told you're wrong. Have you ever been told you were wrong, and it helped you? So the, to think the arrogance that God has to address me, man, I, had to, I, I have had to change so much because of that book. And let me tell you something, guys. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I had three years of it and did some little study. And I know a little bit of it, and I'll tell you what I do. I read the King James Bible, and I will say this to God. You know, you could have translated that and said it this way, and we wouldn't have a problem down here right now. But then I say with that prayer that I gave you the other day, but you're right, and I'm wrong. That guy has a problem saying that. Anything else? Last question. Uh, tags on. This is a personal one that came to mind as you were talking. Can, can you think of, uh, is there any distinction between first generation like yourself and second generation when it comes to attacking, changing, correcting the Bible? The um, attitude. Can you think uh, of any Bible correctors that were first generation Christians or the average between the two, maybe a ratio percentage? Uh, I know a preacher. Uh, I know of a preacher that was a first generation Christian, went to Pensacola Bible Institute, graduated, and now corrects the Bible, uses the ESV. But I don't know enough first-generation Christians and their relationship to the Bible to be, like, you know, like that guy asked that question. I can't give you anything authoritative. I will only say, I will only say this. Sometimes I compare first- and second-generation Christians to first- and second-generation Americans. And, you know, all of us, most of our, most of our parents came over from Europe. Man, did they appreciate what they got here. And the guy that's born here doesn't quite see, you know, we, my wife was talking to a good, good, good young lady. And she goes, I don't understand why you guys make a big deal about patriotism and the flag. And I said, Kathy, quit slapping her. Let me. <laughs> but um, um, so sometimes a second generation Christian doesn't appreciate what they've got. Now, let me say this. If you are a second generation Christian, you got saved at age five, you've got the best testimony in this building. You do not have to go get, get drunk. You do not have to get arrested. I hate that concept that, well, I was a, you know, a drug dealer and I was a, a, you know, a hit man for the mafia and I was a Democrat uh, and then I got saved. <laughs> the best testimony is I never, I had a guy in my church, went to Bob Jones University, still had the, the rosiness in his cheeks. He said, he said, preacher, he said, I was raised on a farm in Pennsylvania. My dad was a deacon. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. I got saved. He said, I've never held a cigarette in my hand. He wasn't being self-righteous. He wasn't like he was better than somebody. He said, I've never held a cigarette in my hand. I've never tasted booze. He said, I don't understand those testimonies. I said, Dave, don't ever think you're missing something. You've got the best testimony. If you're saved young, you've got the best testimony. Don't you listen to some guy like me and think, boy, I missed something. Yeah, you did. You did. But remember this, there's only two kinds of sin, not mortal and venial. The sins you brag about and the sins you're ashamed of. And I remember sitting at a bar and we were bragging about our sins and we all knew things about ourselves we had nobody at that table to know about. So I, I would only say that don't you think in that equation of the, the first generation American and the second, the second generation American owes it to themselves to delve into what they have? So where a second generation Christian is weak on their doctrine, they, they have an obligation. You know, um, well, John, I'm in King James churches around the world for 50 years. And if I see anything in our churches now, it is a 
the emphasis of doctrine. I don't think it's apostasy. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's um, a plan. Here's what you people think. You think your kids get your doctrine through osmosis. If they live in your house, they automatically believe what you believe. And you miss it. They don't get it. And then they turn 18 and they've not been grounded like you were, which is why your Sunday school classes are so important. But um, uh, that person is obligated to find out what they've got. And, and again, not demand God write something for them, but they need to, they need to learn what they've got. Thank you, Dr.